perspective, we're not here because we think that the town, the town manager, or the Department of Public Works is doing anything wrong. In fact, we think everyone's doing exactly the right thing, the thing that is expected by Maryland Department of the Environment. But we're asking for something more than what is asked of the state, and we recognize that. There we go. So quickly, I just want to give a, a brief history of some of the um, historically relevant restoration efforts that kind of set the background for this and bring us to where we are. So in 1972, the Clean Water Act was passed. This act established the TMDLs. So for anyone who may not be familiar with TMDL, it stands for Total Maximum Daily Load. And it is the parameter that limits the amount of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment that can be discharged into a body of water. This is all in efforts to protect water quality across um, US waterways. and. Uh, depending on the size of the water, you can have a personalized and specialized TMDL to smaller bodies of water. So while the Chesapeake Bay has TMDLs, the Corsica River also has a TMDL. Um, these were especially created during the Chesapeake Bay Agreement in 1983, which created an agreement between six watershed states, New York, Pennsylvania, Delaware, West Virginia, Virginia, and Maryland, where these states unified and committed to 31 goals and outcomes to restore the Chesapeake Bay by 2025, which is coming up. And uh, a lot of those goals were based on leveraging uh, laws and um, initiatives that were passed during the Clean Water Act, including establishing a permitting program to accomplish the full elimination of pollution uh, discharges from point sources like wastewater treatment plants. And then I also want to highlight something that's localized. So we've gone from federal to state and wa bay watershed to here in the Corsica. I want to highlight the Corsica watershed project, which started in 2005. Here we are, almost in 2025, $20 million have been spent in partnership between the town, between the state, Department of Natural Resources, and grassroots community organizations like Corsica River Conservancy and others. Um, the Corsica River was the state's first targeted watershed for restoration efforts, and even now today, in 2024, a recent legislative session passed a monumental restoration bill um, that was all based on this targeted effort on the Corsica 20 years ago. Um, so this legacy of investment in this waterway and the partnerships that have come out of it can still be seen today, even as recently as the Millstream Branch um, project being proposed that the town is acquiring for restoration uh, the parcel at the top of Millstream Branches. That's another example of where this good work continues today to restore the Corsica River. So the town's proposal for a wastewater treatment plant upgrade increase the town's capacity by 458,000 gallons per day. Update technology, always a good thing. We like that technology is being upgraded to reduce even more uh, nutrients and sediment from entering the waterway. And surface discharge this new 458,000 gallons per day into the Korsky River year round. So what's the problem? There are a couple of chief reasons that we're concerned. Number one, the TMDL that governs the amount of pollutants that are acceptable to pass into the Corsica is very outdated. It's uh, more than 20 years old and it doesn't reflect the current pressures that exist within the watershed. It doesn't re reflect climate data and science. And in fact, the recent CSER report, which was released by the Chesapeake Bay program by the scientists that are overseeing um, all of our Chesapeake Bay restoration efforts across our six states, you know, they've released a, this report entitled the CSER report about 18 months ago. And in that report, they, they spend a lot of time questioning the validity of the model that is used to generate those TMDLs. So those of us who are engaged in water quality restoration day in and day out have significant concerns about where localized TMDLs stand at present. We are not using best available technology. The Clean Water Act asks that each state incorporate best available technology. And right now, the technology being proposed for the wastewater treatment plant meets Maryland's standards for best available technology. But compared to many other states, including Washington, California, Arizona, and many others, we are lagging behind what best, tech best available technology is. And a lot of those upgrades in other states were born out of the desire to 
reuse water and conserve water for po potable resources, but even in Virginia, in Centerville, Virginia, in fact, they are already utilizing this technology uh, so that they can offset costs of running and operating their wastewater treatment plant and selling that water for watering golf courses and farm fields and other such purposes. So this isn't just a few small pilot projects across the country. This is a well-recognized and documented way of treating wastewater. It's just not in Maryland's way yet. So what is our community proposal? So on behalf of the Corsica's water quality and habitat and community members, we implore MDE and the town of Centerville to establish and implement a pilot program that exceeds the current proposal and has a more positive long-term impact and establishes a model for other jurisdictions to follow. Um, that would be by one, utilizing reverse osmosis or similar technology to achieve zero or near zero nutrient effluent. And that will also, just by de fact, um, address contamination from potential PFAS, pharmaceuticals, and other emerging toxins that we don't, or that we, none of us are currently required to monitor for. Um, and then two, developing a long-term feasibility plan to connect homes on private septic within the critical area of the Corsica to Centerville's plant before allocating <coughs> new capacity to development. And I want to take a second to further explain that. This is an advocacy point that Shore Rivers has been very active on with Queen Anne's County in general and other larger county plants that we've worked with when adding capacity because we are such a rural area non-point source pollution is our largest source of pollution heading in into our waterways. That said, urban stormwater runoff from increased construction is the fastest growing type of pollution in the Chesapeake Bay that we're facing. And so when we're adding capacity to our wastewater treatment plants, which we do have control over, which we can tie a source to, which we can fund for upgraded technology, we wanna do our best to help alleviate that non-point source pressure before adding new non-point source pressure of more urban sprawl. So that would be something that we'd like to see as a part of this pilot program as well. So tonight, we're not asking uh, you all to vote in favor of adding this to the permit and tying the town council to this decision. What we are asking is uh, for a vote of confidence and a letter of support that you are interested in exploring this option. There is funding available for this and the town initiating its interest is a critical first step for us to help as advocates secure a pathway forward. Um, I want to highlight that this pilot program, one, would not alter the town's wastewater permit from MDE. So the permit that the town is currently pursuing, the things that we are suggesting in this pilot program are not required by the state of Maryland, so it would not alter your permit or derail that application process. It would just outperform the permit. Exactly. <clears throat> and it would not delay the process that I know has already taken you all so long and so much work to undertake. It would not alter the size of the building currently being proposed to be designed in conversations we've had with the town manager and the third party contractor that's designing this. They are well aware that technologies to remove PFAS are coming. The EPA has just released their statement and guidance on removing PFAS from drinking water. Wastewater will soon follow. It's only a matter of time before these technologies are required in permits. And so it is already specced to add these technologies so no, no uh, altering of the size of the building or the design. Um, it would not, as I said, derail or delay the approval process for the project design currently proposed, and it would pr protect and build upon the progress made over the last 20 years through restoration efforts by this town and community organizations. And finally, it would maximize environmentally oriented grants and funding sources to offset the costs. So to talk about the costs for a moment, I can get the slide. So our organizations, as I mentioned, are poised and ready to help the advocates and resources to help fund this initiative, which is going above and beyond. Um, I, up on the screen, I have highlighted a couple of resources that are ready and waiting for us to tap into. So University of Maryland Environmental Finance Center is an incredible resource um, that exists to help towns access funding to upgrade their infrastructure and achieve clean water goals and community uh, oriented goals for uh, public health. The um, 
Environmental Finance Center currently contracts as a technical assistance service provider to MDE and can be a resource for the town, but MDE has to ask them to do that, and MDE is not going to ask them to do that if the town is not asking for it. So that's why we're here with you tonight. You have to be the first step. Um, the Bay Restoration Fund, BRF Clean Water Commerce Account, which pays for performance. It's a grant program that was established three years ago. Um, that pays for performance so um, the idea is that sometimes these projects can you know uh, be incredibly expensive projects and can last 20 years and you're paid out over the life of that project as you demonstrate reductions of what isn't going into the waterway thanks to that project so this could be a really interesting opportunity to apply for that pot of funding for the town of centerville um, and then the state revolving loan fund. So right now we're kind of at this really critical time, thanks to the Caesar report and the fact that we're here in 2025 and we are not where we want to be to achieving our goals for overall Bay restoration. The Maryland legislature, Department of Natural Resources, Maryland Department of the Environment are looking at people to go outside the box and to propose solutions that haven't been tried before. And they are opening up funding to do such a thing. Um, and so, um, you know, this is, this is a really kind of fortuitous time for us to pursue something like this. The Bay Restoration so. Fund is taking a hard look at increasing funding for operations and maintenance, because yeah. O&M is, is something that's um, lagging behind in all of the upgraded wastewater treatment plants across the state. I mean, Baltimore is grappling with that and many others. Right. So the, there are options there. You know, I, I, there, there could certainly be more costs associated with operating the, the increased plant. I mean, ultimately, though, we're all paying into the Bay Restoration Fund. I mean, there's only so much money. I want to say just for anyone in the public and, and certainly for anyone watching at home that might not be so super aware, we're aware of these funding sources. We've gotten the bulk of the money that we have right now from the Bay Restoration Fund legislatively. We are hoping not to have to dip into the state's revolving loan fund, although we've been offered that opportunity by the legislature. But it's our hope to not saddle future generations of this town with another $20 million of debt. So I, I just don't want anyone to think that like we until this moment we had no idea how to get money from the state for this project because it's what we've been doing for three years.